And we know without question that without Jesus, without him, Christianity would just be another religion, right? It would just be another religion among many in this world. It's Christ that sets Christianity apart. In fact, the whole concept of Christianity is to be Christ-like. Paul writes to the Christians in Colossians, or in Colossae, the city of Colossae, in Colossians chapter 2, and I'm going to read it. It's going to be on the screen uh, for you. Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 8, Paul says this, to see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Father, we pray your blessings upon your word. Pray your blessings upon our hearts. Lord, we desire to have ears that will hear and to receive your word, Lord, that it may continue to perfect the work that you have begun in us by faith, so that that faith may extend beyond us as we witness of the truth of who Jesus is. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Oh God, may we receive your word, that we may be strengthened according to your will and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, we know. It's the very essence of God. The very essence. And he is the one that has come to take away our sins, to take away the sins of the world, and to reveal the Father in human form. That's what Colossians says here. And this revelation that Christ is the extension, or he is the visible representation of the Godhead, it leads us to the next of God's names that we're going to consider tonight in our study. In fact, this is possibly one of my favorite names of God to consider and study. And the reason that it's one of my favorite names to study is because this name of God, as he reveals himself, it embodies and it fulfills Feels all the means through which God has revealed himself. All the names find fulfillment and representation in this name. And it is the name by which we receive the greatest intimate revelation of God himself. And we're given that name through Matthew's account of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 1, let's begin reading with verse 21. Matthew 1, beginning with verse 21. As you state this truth, she, talking about Mary, will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, which is Savior. For he shall save his people from their sins, Yahshua. Now all this took place, verse 22 says, to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Distinctly we know the prophet Isaiah. Verse 23, this is the prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name, and here it is, Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God with us. Matthew here is quoting a prophecy given by Isaiah to the king or to King Ahaz of Judah. It's a prophecy that was spoken in Isaiah chapter 7 and, and verse 14. And when you look there at Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah speaks to Ahaz and tells him, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And this is the sign. This is the promise. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, the name Emmanuel appears only one other time in the Old Testament, and that's in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 8. 
The name Emmanuel is an, in a very immediate context was given here in Isaiah 7, 14. It was given to a child who would be born in the time of Ahaz as a sign to the king that Judah would receive relief from the attack of Israel and of Syria. Because at this time, Israel, if you look back, Israel and Syria were under the thumb of Assyria. And they were tired of being under the thumb of Assyria, so they were going to rebel. And in the process of rebelling against Syria, they looked down to Judah in the south, and they were afraid that possibly they would attack, so they were going to conquer Judah, put their own puppet king in place, so that they would not have to fear any attack from the south, according to what history tells us when we study back. So in this process, Ahaz was going to make a treaty with Assyria because of the threat of attack from Israel and Syria. And it was in this process that Ahaz, not being a good king, he was a very wicked king. He wasn't like his father, and he wouldn't be like his son that would soon reign, which was Hezekiah. He was a wicked king, but in that even in that, God gave a promise because of his servant David. And Isaiah 7, 14 is that promise. And through King Ahaz's fear of his reign that it would soon come to an end because of the threat of attack from the north, from Syria and Israel, God sent the prophet Isaiah and declared that God would not allow this to happen. God would not allow Israel nor Syria to remove Ahaz from the throne. God would maintain the promise that he had given to his servant David that his descendants would continually sit upon the throne. And in order to confirm that these two kings, the king of Syria, the king of Israel, would not conquer Judah, Isaiah prophesied that the Lord would give to Ahaz a son. I know I hadn't said it in a while, and you guys are expecting it. Hang with me. I have a point to make. But in order to assure Ahaz that God would keep him, Isaiah prophesied that the Lord would give him a sign. And the sign was just simply this. From Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin would give birth. That was the sign. A virgin would give birth. And that this child's name would be Emmanuel, which translated to us means God with us. So the very name of this child symbolized the fact, now we need to understand this, this is the foundation of it all. The very name of this child being Emmanuel, it symbolized the fact that God would demonstrate God himself would demonstrate his presence with his people in this deliverance. God himself, because God says, I'm going to give a child from a virgin. His name will be and signify to you, I am with you. I am with you. His presence, God's presence with his people in this deliverance. It had an immediate context that a child in Ahaz's day would be born, and it would be a sign that Israel and Syria would not remove Ahaz from the throne. Now let's fast forward to our text from Matthew. And when we fast forward to, to Matthew and Matthew's day, when we do a little dig and we find that here in this scripture, Matthew views the prophecy of Isaiah as fulfilled in its future messianic context through the birth of Jesus by the Virgin Mary. That there was an immediate fulfillment in Ahaz's day but there was a future, even greater fullness of the fulfillment that came through Jesus through the birth of the Virgin Mary. In fact, when we go back and we dig a little bit, we'll find that even Jewish scholars, before the day of Jesus, before he was born, that Jewish scribes, 
they saw a deeper meaning in the context when they interpreted Emmanuel from Isaiah 7, 14, meaning God with us, to be a promise of the golden age. And we find this in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4, Isaiah 9, verses 9 through 7, Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 16, that speak of a coming golden age of the nation of Israel when the messianic king from God will come and supplant all their enemies and establish Israel as the predominant power again. And God will rule from the city. (coughs) This will happen when the messianic son of David bring judgment on the wicked and blessing to the righteous. The Jewish scribes, before Jesus came, they saw that Isaiah 7, 14 had a deeper meaning in the context of God with us through the coming of the Messiah. Because this was to be the ultimate time of God's presence manifested to Israel, to God's people. That's what Emmanuel means. It literally means God's presence manifested in an ultimate way to his people. The name Emmanuel here in Matthew 1.23, we understand as Matthew reveals <coughs> that it declares the presence of God with his people in a way that is altogether new. It's altogether new. It's deeper than even as it was fulfilled in an immediate sense in King Ahaz's day. Now as we look to this name Emmanuel, God with us, Matthew isn't just referring to the birth of a baby. Isaiah 7, 14 was referring to just the birth of a baby. And it signified God's promise that he would watch over David's throne. But here in Matthew, In Matthew 1, 23, it refers to more than just a birth of a baby. Matthew states the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 7, 14, that God himself, and I know we know this, but hang with me, God himself became a what? A baby, right? God himself became a baby. In fact, God himself further expounds through the prophet Isaiah on this promise in Isaiah 9 and verse 6 when he says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Now let's not run past what Isaiah is stating there. What God is speaking through his prophet, not just to Israel, but there's a greater context, a greater fulfillment than just to the people of Israel. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Isaiah says the child is born. Notice that. The child is born, but the son is what? The son is given. The child is born, but the son is given. And this wording is significant because it speaks to the reality that this child existed even before the virgin became pregnant. Before Mary became pregnant with Jesus, Jesus existed. Because the child was born, but the son was what? Given. Given. He was given. Jesus wasn't born. He was given. It was God who shepherds found wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Emmanuel, God with us in the fullest sense. In the fullest sense, God with us. And as God was with us, Jesus repeatedly told the Pharisees his mission. He repeatedly told the Pharisees the reason he came, the reason the child was born, the reason the son was given. Jesus says repeatedly, in fact, in John 6, 38, he spoke this. He says, for I have come down from heaven (coughs) not to do my will, 
but the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, I've come to do the Father's will. And I've come to do it in a perfect way. Why? Because he is the son who had always existed, who was given. But notice in this context and in this name, Emmanuel, not only did Jesus come to do the will of the Father, but as the name Emmanuel proclaims, he came so that we could know what it's like to have God with us. Well, just think about that. And I know that you have, but, but let's open our minds and open our hearts to it afresh again that this scripture never becomes just something we've been taught and something we've become accustomed to because it is the foundation of our faith. It is the surety of who we are in God because God is with us in an intimate way. Because a child was born, but a son was given. A son was given. Jesus came so that we would know what it's like to have God with us. That when I walk through the day as his disciple, I know what it's like to have God with me. When I lay my head down at night, I can do so in peace because why? I know what it means to have God with me. Without Emmanuel, we would have no chance of fully understanding God. But just think about Moses. He saw God's glory. He heard God audibly speak to him. And what did Moses say? Lord, I want to see your glory. Disclose yourself to me fully. But there was no way in that context that Moses could see God in his fullness. And we know the story that God hid him in the cleft of the rock. And basically what Moses saw was the afterglow of God's presence. But now, now, we know God in a full sense. Why? Because Jesus came. Jesus walked among us. Philip even asked, Lord, if you would, it would be enough for us if you would just reveal the Father to us. And you remember what Jesus said to Philip in response to that? He says, Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't understand when you see me, you see the Father. When you, all this time you've experienced who I am and the things that I have done and the way that I have treated people and cared for people and the way that I've treated you and cared for you and have loved you, do you not understand that that's the Father because I and the Father are what? One. I am the fulfillment of what Isaiah spoke in the greatest sense that I am Emmanuel. I am God who is with you intimately and personally. Because without Jesus, without Emmanuel, we would not have any chance of fully comprehending. That's why Paul writes to the Ephesians. That's why he writes to the, to, uh, the, the Colossians. That's why he writes also in Philippians. What we know is the prison epistles, that he's praying for these individuals. He's praying that God, because of their love and their devotion to Christ, that they would grow even more intimately in their understanding and their knowledge of the Father. Why? Because of Emmanuel, God with us. To understand and know Jesus and Emmanuel is to understand and know the Father. And what is amazing about this name is that Isaiah begins to pull the curtain back before Jesus comes. In Isaiah 9, in verse 6, he pulls the curtain back because Jesus is the full representation of the Godhead and of the Father as Paul reveals in Colossians and as he reveals in Ephesians and in other places. But Isaiah pulls the curtain back in, in, in chapter 9 and verse 6 and he begins to speak about who Emmanuel is. Who he is to us, God with us. You know the scripture, verse 6. After saying, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government shall rest on his shoulders, and here it is, and his name. 
His name, and as we've been studying the names of God, it is God's character. It is his essence. It's who he is. It's how he relates to his creation. It's how he moves and how he loves his creation and the way that he reveals himself through his names. It says here that in his name, Emmanuel, we know this is referring to Emmanuel, and his name, Isaiah 9, 6, will be called what? Wonderful Counselor. That's who Emmanuel is. He is wonderful counselor. I love this name. The reason I love it is because it reflects all of God's names in perfection. And here Isaiah says, as Emmanuel, he is our wonderful counselor. He is the God who is with us, who is our counselor. He has counsel for every crisis. Aren't you thankful for that? He has counsel for every crisis. He has a plan for every problem. He has a direction for every dilemma. He has a prescription for every pain. He has a message for every person. Those aren't just plays on words. That's the reality. Because Emmanuel, God is with us. He's the living word, the infallible source of guidance, the inexhaustible wisdom and truth and way. On him rests the government, which means the entitlement to rule. And the government will rest on his shoulders. He has the entitlement to rule. He is our wonderful counselor. But not only that, notice also, Emmanuel, he is the mighty God. And what does that speak to? It speaks to the fact, and we know this, I just want to encourage you with it as we're looking at the names of God. And we begin to again freshly reflect on who God is with us. He is mighty God. Is Emmanuel God with us? He is mighty God. In other words, Jesus never fails. We say those words. We can say those words, but do we trust? Do we believe in those words? Do we believe that Jesus never fails us? In every circumstance and situation, because he is Emmanuel, God with us, he is mighty God. He never fails. He is always faithful. As Emmanuel, as mighty God, do we walk in the knowledge of the fact that all of the power of creation, all of the power of creation stands behind his promise to provide and care for us. He is the God who fed over 5,000 with just a few loaves and a few fish, right? A couple of loaves, a couple of fish, and there was 12 baskets left over. He is the God that stepped out on the bow of the ship and spoke to the winds and the waves, and they became still as glass. Everything that we read of in the gospel accounts, everything that we read of in the New Testament, we understand that we can trust in his faithfulness because he never fails and his power is always with us and it is all of the power of creation that stands behind his promise to provide and to care for us. Christ conquered everything, everything comes up against us because he has conquered everything that has come up against him and he took it to the cross our sins and he nailed them to the cross and died for us he was buried in Joseph's tomb and on on schedule he rose from the grave the power of his omnipotence As mighty God, and I'm moving on, we must understand Emmanuel, God with us, he is mighty God. And his hands are the hands that have formed all things. And his hands are strong enough to defeat any enemy, yet his hands are gentle enough to comfort any heart. No, he's mighty God, and one of the ways that we can Define that name might. It can be defined as the ability to use strength strategically for the good of others. He's not just a king that dominates. He is the mighty God who uses his ability for the good of others. 
Jesus, Emmanuel, embodies might in its most perfect form. He precedes all authority in their prox. In their priority, he exceeds all others in their superiority, and he succeeds everyone in their finality. Why? Because he is Emmanuel, God with us, mighty God. Not only that, but notice also wrapped up in that a name Emmanuel is not just wonderful counselor, not just mighty God, but he's the eternal father. In Hebrew, using the word father speaks to the originator of a thing. And Isaiah here is again pointing to the fact of the pre-existence of Christ. In fact, John said it this way in John chapter 1 and in, in, in verses 1 through 3. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The Word translated everlasting not only does it speak of the originator, something creator, but that word also translated, it can mean everywhere present. Not only is he the originator of all things, but it speaks to the fact that as the everlasting father, he is everywhere present. He has the divine attribute of both eternity and omnipresent as he rules. And as we go back as far as we possibly can in time, and there's a lot of debate on this even today, but as we go back as far as we can in time, we have to understand that we are no closer to the origin of God. Why? Because here it says he is everlasting. In other words, everlasting has no beginning. It has no end. It always has been. Always. He is the wonderful counselor, is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. And Isaiah also points and digs a little deeper into who Emmanuel is as God with us. He is the prince of peace. He his reign will be characterized, Isaiah says, by shalom. And shalom is a very, as you guys know, shalom is a very important word to the Jewish people. They don't just speak that word. There's meaning when they speak shalom, peace be with you. It's very important because that word shalom does not mean an absence of conflict. Now, when we, as human beings, talk about peace, there can't be any peace if there's conflict, right? We wouldn't say there's peace if there's war, would we? We wouldn't say there's peace if there's conflict. We wouldn't say there's peace if there's disaster. Because our meaning of peace is there's no war. Our meaning of peace is everything's quiet, everything's still. But shalom goes much deeper than that. The word shalom, the word peace, it comes from the Hebrew because it comes from God and the fact of Emmanuel, God with us. It means that I have peace even in the midst of war. It means that I have peace even in the midst of tragedy. It means I have peace of mind, of heart, and of body even in the midst of my trouble. Why? Because God, Emmanuel, God with us is the Prince of Peace. His rule, his rule is what will bring health, well-being, spiritual prosperity, and joy into our lives. And we know in the future tense that when Messiah, Messiah does come, and all things are under his feet and he reigns, and he will bring peace to this world. Peace. Now, as we look at this name, one of my favorite names because of everything that it represents. From the beginning of the world to its end, Jesus is the visible manifestation of God's character and his names. Jesus is 
the visible manifestation of God's care. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. How can God be with us? Because God has come. Born as a baby. But in that birth of that baby, a son, the eternal son, was given. There is no place we can look and not see Jesus. We are because of him. Our existence is found in him. Everything that we do is because of and is for the glory and the honor and exaltation of Christ. He's everywhere. He is everything. He should be our everything. Amen? He should be our everything. Knowing him intimately because he is Emmanuel, he is God with us. Knowing him intimately, and I'm going to ask, you'll come back to the piano, Kip. But knowing him intimately and personally radically changes our lives. You know, it's been said that today's social science, today's social science is able to put a new suit on a man. I can agree with that statement. Today's social science is able, I'm talking about psychology and these concepts of counseling, that they are able to put a new suit on a man. But it is only Christ as Emmanuel, God with us, all that he's done by living a perfect sinless life and by becoming our sacrifice on the cross and rising again, laying his life down and having the power to pick it back up, it is only Christ who can put a new man in a suit. Only Christ. Why? Because he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. And this fulfillment that was given was not just for Israel. We know that it's for all people. All people. The same power that created the universe is the same power that can strengthen me, that can strengthen you to grow and change and experience unspeakable satisfaction. Why? Because it's Emmanuel, God with us. It is only through his name that every person is able to receive the gift of eternal life. Why? Because it's Emmanuel, God with us. It's by faith in his name and in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection that we are given the gift of salvation. Why? Because Matthew said, the angel even came and proclaimed, you will call him Yeshua, Jesus, because the reason he has come is to save his people from sin. As we sit here and as I look across the sanctuary I look at believers we know the reality of this name God with us are we sharing that reality are we sharing that reality that we're not getting caught up in vaccination or not vaccinated. We're not getting caught up in Democrat or Republican or Independent. We're not getting caught up in any of those things that cause strife and division. Are we being called up in Emmanuel, God with us? Is that what we're sharing? Because he's the only one that can put a new man, a new person in sin. In that reality every day. Emmanuel. 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 God with us. God with us. Father, we come before you tonight. And Lord God, we thank you. Can we do that? We thank you for the reality, for the promise that has been given through this name as you have revealed yourself through your son that has been given. Emmanuel, you are God with us. 
Come on, can we give him praise? If you want to stand to your feet, if you want to lift your hands, can we thank him? Can we thank him from the bottom of our hearts, from the bottom of our souls? Can we thank him? Can we express our gratitude and our praise for the reality that we are able to live every day, every moment of every day, in every crisis and every triumph, we're able to live the experience of God with us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.